With me today is Dylan Clayton. After finishing high school, Dylan opted to head to TAFE, where he found himself quickly bored by the course content and decided to look for a job instead. Within months of securing a trainee role, Dylan was involved in a terrible accident that impacted him and his family physically, emotionally and financially. Welcome, Dylan, and thanks for joining me today. Thanks, Christy. Pleasure to be on the uh, on the podcast. I've had a fair few uh, interesting guests so far. So, uh, yeah, hopefully it all goes well and uh, be interested to see what the future holds. Absolutely. Now, Dylan, you started studying at TAFE, which is quite an edu uh, like a popular education path straight out of high school. So what did you start studying and why did you choose that course? Yeah, so I went into TAFE once I graduated year 12. Um, I started doing computer electronics. Now, it was something I didn't really know exactly what I wanted to do when I finished school. I knew I always wanted to do something. Well, I thought I wanted to do something to do with computers. Um, I was always into computing at school, got reasonably good grades, um, always playing video games in that sort of circle. Um, so yeah, I thought, I don't know exactly what I want to do, so I'll do some, some sort of course to do with computers and, and work it out from there. Um, got to the course and, and just really thought it wasn't exactly what I wanted. I thought I was going to be setting, setting things up, programming, networking, all that sort of stuff to get a job in IT. But a lot of the course was towards actually physically building the parts. So there was a lot of like soldering, electrical diagrams and stuff like that. And I thought I, I never wanted to work in a factory on assembly line. So yeah, just didn't, didn't interest me. It was completely different to what I thought it was going to be. So on reflection, where do you think that disconnect happened? Do you think the school and the TAFE just didn't explain the course to you correctly? Or do you think that as a young person, you didn't really take the time to understand exactly what you're going into? Because I think that happens a lot. People have the expectation of a course is going to be something and then they start doing it and it's something completely different and it, it puts them quite off. So where do you think the disconnect lied? Um, I think it was probably a bit of both. I mean, I'd say the most part was probably uh, more on myself, just sort of being younger and not necessarily knowing or understanding. Um, I mean, like anything, the course content is, is fairly well written and labelled out when, when you apply for these things. So it's probably just a mis misinterpretation at my end. So it would say things like um, assemble computers and, and all those sort of things, but I didn't realise it was a case of physically building them from scratch. I thought it would be like it like your it or computer repair shop you, you're putting things together making it work so yeah i think it was probably just a misunderstanding on my end and, and not necessarily realizing what i was uh, signing up for so did you have good careers um guidance at school because i a lot of people that i speak to i have asked about you know their experiences during high school and it seems like the school and the actual careers uh, guidance that they do get plays a really big role into the next step that they take so how did, how was your experience with that yeah, so we did have a, uh, a careers course at school um, and that, that was run predominantly through year 11 and 12, where it was just a couple of classes a week. Um, the, the issue with that was you kind of had to know what you wanted to do. So that, that was more my, my problem. I mean, they, they would certainly help you uh, develop into different things that you wanted to do or uh, different pathways or things you should work on. Um, but a lot of it, and until you really made up your mind what you wanted to do before then, it was hard to take a start. So you'd kind of just plod along doing the bare minimum of the classes to get by um, without really having some sort of sense of what you were doing or where you were going. Now, what sort of influence did your parents play in the decisions that you made after you left school? Um, yeah, quite a quite a big one. I mean, Dad is quite successful in, in business and sales. Um, and, and I was always good at, at business classes uh, in school as well. So yeah, I've always had quite a good sort of grounding or, or upbringing when it comes to sort of business sense and, and, and how a lot of those things work. So yeah, I was always working from 13 or 14 or whatever the youngest you're allowed to work. I worked part time after school. Um, yeah, for basically five days a week, just short shifts, um, but, but enough to get by consistently. And yeah, I always just, I had that work ethic that I always had to do something. Even even when I left TAFE, I, I thought I can't just leave and do nothing. So I made sure that I went and got another job first, or not another, got a a job first uh, before I quit, so that I knew I had something that I was walking into. 
be a, definitely definitely a strong influence to always make sure you're doing something and, and not sitting around wasting time doing nothing. Yeah, so that was going to be my next question. So obviously you decided that the course content, you know, this course was not for you. You needed to do something else. So did you consciously make a decision to go into a particular role or was your uh, mind frame that you were just going to just, just leave, get a job and then look for, you know, your career after that? Yeah, it's a bit of a tough question. I mean, I, so I didn't necessarily know what I wanted. At, at different stages through school, I'm, I would have gone from saying I was going to be a chef to being an accountant to being a computer person. Um, it just yeah, there was no sort of set thing that I wanted to do. Um, but I knew getting into the sort of private sector, uh, where a lot of my family background is, um, that through dad's networks contacts, I'd always sort of have have a base that I could start at. And, and so I just started applying at different places, um, different retail places or, or companies, hire, travel agents, um, anything like that. And a traineeship come up through Coates Hire where I am now. And dad had a look and said, you know, out of all these places you've gone for, like this is the one you, you really want to get. I mean, obviously if, it, if it's what you want to do, that, that's up to you, it's completely your choice. But in terms of uh, companies and stuff like that, that they had a reputation or a bigger company. He said, like, this is probably the best one to go. And yeah, so I went, went to the interview and luckily I got it. And so I didn't necessarily know that I wanted to be in the hire industry. It just sort of fell into it. And yeah, I've loved it ever since. So nine months after you started that role, you were involved in quite a serious car accident. So could you talk us through that? Yeah, so, so yeah, I was uh, coming home from work one night um, in between sort of houses where I was going, some days at Dad's or some days at Mum's, I was still living at home. Um, so yeah, I went to come back to Dad's place, going through sort of semi-rural areas and that was probably 7.30 or so at, at night, so I'm quite dark. The uh, a pallet had fallen off the truck probably 30 seconds or so in front of me. Now, because it was dark, I, I didn't know until I reached the pallet on the floor and uh, been sort of semi-country roads. It's, it's, they're the kind of roads where it's sealed down the middle, but you've got gravel edges. It's only a skinny, skinny sort of road. Now, I was only 18 on my P-plates. I see it at the last minute. The first thing I'm thinking is like, oh, no, I don't want to hit that because that's going to wreck my car. So the first thing I do is swerve. And the speed limit along that road is about 90k an hour. So when you're doing 90k an hour and all of a sudden you swerve and you try and correct, you have nothing. So, yeah, it's um, quite, a, quite an interesting experience. It's, it's quite hard to explain when you're sitting there and all of a sudden your hands are on the steering wheel and you can turn it and there's no resistance. And re then you realise your wheels aren't actually on the floor. Um, you can't see anything. You, all you can feel is you're just moving. And, and the only thing you're sitting there and you're thinking is, well... I don't actually know how I'm going to stop here. And yeah, it's, it's quite a um, quite a surreal feeling, kind of hard to explain so until, it, until it's happened. Yeah, like I knew exactly what was going on, but yeah, you can't do a thing about it. You just buckle in and, and hold on basically. But I mean, say the, the truck driver wouldn't have even known that he'd lost the pallet. It was just a, an empty pallet that's rattled loose or hit a bump and he wouldn't have even known. So it would, would have made no difference at all to them. Now, it was quite serious and you sustained some injuries. So what sort of injuries were they? Yeah, so I had quite a lot of uh, damage to sort of my forehead and eye socket area, uh, which is quite a lot of the scars along here. Um, so that seems to, we think, is from the centre mirror. The car rolled three times, landed on its roof. Um, and when you see the photos, the whole sort of front windscreen and roof is, is caved in in a, in a big V. So we seem to think that it's probably the centre mirror or that big dent on the roof that's taken sort of a big chunk out of uh, my eyebrow and, and forehead. So, um, yeah, there's a big sort of open wound uh, on my forehead, which took quite a long time to, to heal and close up. Um, had a hair transplant for to try and recreate an eyebrow along here um, because they said that the whole sort of hair cells had been grinded off against the road. So, yeah, they've, they've tried to regrow an eyebrow there. Uh, both my ears were sliced straight long ways and just sort of hanging, so they got stitched back together. Uh, and then, yeah, I had a big bruise. Uh, it's not a bruise, sorry, a burn down the length of my arm. So what happened with that, funnily enough, wasn't actually anything to do with the crash. But the car landed on its roof, and I was still conscious enough to get myself out. So I was quite dazed, but still conscious enough to get out. 
And so I managed to shuffle through the doors, eventually got out the back door. It was the only one that would open. And I didn't have the strength to pull myself up because I was quite groggy. So I've, I've leant across the car to, to help sort of leverage and pull myself up and evidently put my arm straight across the exhaust pipe. So after I thought I've, I've managed to get out of the crash, got, got some injuries, thought I'm finally done, and then I've gone and hurt myself again later. So yeah, it didn't, uh, it just wasn't supposed to be my day, but evidently I'm, uh, I'm still here and made it in the end. So someone was looking out for me somewhere. That's it. You're, you're here and you're doing well and that's all that matters. But I just want to know, like, you know, you were 18 years old, a young man, and we all know the, the crash statistics and the blame, I suppose, that gets placed on young people with regards to those statistics. So did you feel pressure that people thought that it the accident was your fault because you were young and you may have been speeding or, you know, you may not have known what to do in that sort of instance? Yeah, sometimes, dude, especially sort of initially, you'd sit there and you'd start explaining to the story that uh, it's like you're an 18-year-old male driver on your P plates and you've rolled your car. Instantly, before anyone asks the question, the first thing you sit there and is you tell everyone, you know, I was doing the speed limit, I didn't do anything wrong, it wasn't my fault, this is what happened. And you end up telling the whole story of what actually happened before anyone's even asked because you kind of get that assumption that people are going, oh, it's another one of those young drivers being stupid. It's like, well, no, actually, I didn't. It was just pure bad luck. But you're definitely right. There is this sort of stigma or pressure that you think people are going to ask you. Yeah, definitely. I think that's sort of where people's, you know, minds go straight to, especially, you know, with young males. It's just straight away it has to be their fault. And, you know, unfortunately in this situation, you know, a drug a drive driver was completely unaware and, you know, probably not following the right safety, you know, um, protocols himself, which caused it. So I wanted to ask you, though, what's your what were your parents' reactions to it? Because I imagine they would have been completely freaked out about, you know, their, their son being, you know, significantly injured in a car accident in between their homes. Yeah, they were um, obviously no doubt quite shocked. So what actually happened, uh, uh, the car behind me was probably about a minute or so behind me pulled over to check that I was all right and funnily enough happened to be a, uh, a an off-duty paramedic. And so he sort of helped me, sat me down um, and asked what, you know, what the best contact number is, someone to call. And I happened to give him mum's number, which was the first number that came to my head. And so he was on the phone telling mum, she's obviously quite panicked and shocked, um, just saying, like, oh, I just want to I just want to speak to him. It doesn't matter what, just let me speak to him, just so I know he's alive sort of thing. And so from what I understand, I didn't really say much. It was just sort of like mumbling because I didn't have the energy or and wasn't with it to do it. But pardon me, once you heard that, um, yeah, it was, it was more sort of, well, at least he's here. Like, we don't know what, what's going on next, but like I've spoke to him. Like, I know it's okay. And then the mad rush was on for everyone to, to get to hospital. So dad had actually got a call. I, th- I dare say mum had probably called him uh, to tell him as well. And he'd actually raced down and, and managed to get to the scene before the ambulance had, had left. And so, yeah, he saw it and, and was able to come down. But yeah, it's been quite a long time. I was probably about two weeks or so. Um, it's mainly because there was, there's such an open wound and given it was so close to my forehead and my brain, um, if you were to get any sort of infection, it doesn't have too far to travel to obviously reach your brain, whereas if you get a cut on your arm or your leg or, or anything like that. So I had to be sort of extra careful and, and quite well cared for um, for a decent period of time. Now, as I, I mentioned... So too. Sorry, Dylan, go. So I think uh, more so too, I mean, I'm a, I am my only child, so I suppose for them, if anything happened to me, um, then that's it. There isn't sort of anyone else to, to lean on or watch grow up or anything like that. It, it, it's just me. So I suppose it probably would have hit a little bit harder uh, for them than sort of multiple child families. Oh, definitely. I think, yeah, having an only child, it's um, that your baby, you know, they're number one. So I, I completely can um, relate to your parents' reactions to that. Now, you had only been with your role, as I said earlier, for about nine months. So, and then this accident happens and, you know, you're a young person, you're a trainee. What do you tell your boss and what's going through your mind when you're sitting in hospital trying to recover from these injuries but worrying about work as well? What were you thinking? Yeah, I was, um, I was actually really fortunate. So my work was great when everything happened. 
Um, so I initially just gave Dad a list of names of people to, to sort of call and email and, and let them know, uh, like my current manager and, and HR and, and things like that. I just said, just call these people, let them know what's going on. Um, and that I'll, obviously I will be back, but I don't know when. You're sort of sitting there, like, like you said, you, you might worry about it a little bit. So but they, they put that to rest pretty quickly. Um, so given I was only nine months in, I didn't really have any accumulation of leave or anything like that. So um, they were more than happy to let me sit in negative and so I could still get paid, pay the bills, uh, anything like that, whatever I needed while I was out. Um, and yeah, that was fine. So I'd come back, uh, had light duties for quite a long time. I'd always wanted to come back to work early, but there's a little bit of gap before I was one allowed to drive because um, I had a little bit of sort of blurred vision on the when it comes to the road lines, I'd see double on the outside line. Um, so that, that stopped me for a little while. And also because the wound on my forehead took sort of multiple months to, to close up and also the burn on my arm was, was still sort of open for quite a long time. I couldn't work where I normally worked. And that was, that was purely because it's a, it's quite a dirty sort of workshop environment. There was a, even though we're a retail shop, it was more industrial. So there was always lots of greases, oil, stuff like that around. So everything that I was doing before, um, I could no longer do. So yeah, I had a sort of extended, uh, extended stay off work and then came back in light duty in a similar role elsewhere. Um, but yeah, that, those were more than, uh, more than great for, for me and my family every, through the whole lot. That's really good to hear. And, you know, you came back and you came back with gusto. You, you were so determined to move through the ranks. And now you've worked your way um, up to branch manager in March 2020. You achieved that goal, which is absolutely no easy feat, especially in a company like Coates where it's hugely competitive. There's lots of people vying for those sort of positions. So what sort of qualities do you think that you possess to in all, it, that enabled you to move into such roles? Um, I think a lot of it is things that I've learned along the way from, from different people. So I've always had ethics to sort of be a hard worker, I'd always do that extra bit more without being asked. Um, if anything sort of came up, I, I'd put my hand up and jump at it. So always made it known that I was wanting to do stuff and willing to help. And if there was a big sort of project or anything like that, like I wanted to be involved in it. Um, so I'd always done my best to just sort of put my best foot forward in those sort of cases. Um, and then a lot of it is things that I've learned along the way. So because I've moved around to so many sort of locations and branches um, and also different sort of departments, um, I've had a fair few managers across the time and you'd, you'd learn different things off each and sort of pick different things you liked off different people to make them your own style and, and all, all very different, but they, um, yeah, they've they all sort of come together in the way that I need them to, do, to that set me where I'm going today. Now, I just sort of want to, you know, tell the listeners that a lot of people sort of look to people like you that have gone from, you know, being a trainee to now being a manager and think that it happened overnight, but it doesn't. So how long did it take you to sort of reach that goal that you had set? So for myself, it, it took about nine years. So from the time I started the traineeship up until branch manager, it was about nine years. So I'd, I'd got relatively close or the closest you can get previously in about seven and a half that was doing a relief branch manager role um so i would get moved anywhere on a daily basis depending on who had leave or or anything like that and i would run the branches for that time so i did that for about a year and a half prior but then getting my own branch was yeah about nine years since i started now did you find it difficult progressing into management certain aspects yeah, the 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 day to day actually doing the job, it was sort of nothing new because I'd done it for so long previously. Um, but yeah, certain aspects like when it would come to people relations and all of a sudden like you're that person if there's a problem that people come to, um, take, would take a little while to get used to. Um, but aside from that, it's uh, no, I've, I've loved it and yeah, it hasn't it hasn't been too much of a struggle. You certainly do get some things that pop up every now and then where you thought, oh. Oh, right, that's what management's been about. But, yeah, overall, it's um, yeah, it's great. And what have you learned about yourself since progressing into a management position? Oh, it's a very good question. I suppose it's probably learned that I'm, I am capable of, of more than I think and more so that people actually do look up and listen to you. I suppose when you're, especially because I was uh, so young when I started, 
you'd kind of ask people to do things and they'd look at you and oh, I've been in the business for so long, you're a kid, like you don't know what you're talking about, why are we listening to you for? And then w sometimes it works, I suppose, through experience and the fact you've been there for a while and people get to know who you are. Um, but also the title sort of comes with a bit of reputation. It's almost like they have to listen because you have the title, but then they start wanting to. Um, so yeah, I suppose actually learning that you no know, people people are listening and we're all on the right path and if i do something by example people will actually listen and copy what i'm doing um yeah once i sort of click to that 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 actually does happen yeah it, it's become a lot more easier and i think you've just hit the nail on the head there dylan with regards to you know management versus leadership so management you know people obviously have to listen to what you're saying but you know when you're a true leader people want to so to be able to to do that so early in your career is absolutely fantastic did you find it difficult though going from working as co-workers with people to moving into that management position where you had to tell them what to do and they had to listen to you um not necessarily. I think for me, because I'd done the relief role prior, so if I'd gone from a the sales coordinator to branch manager in the same branch, possibly because you have that sort of, uh, well, I would have had five years where I've been their mate, basically, and then all of a sudden going to their boss, people might think you're sort of different. But I had that year and a half gap where I went to relief and that allowed me to get to all the branches um, in Perth and get to know basically everyone. So from, from sort of mechanics to other office staff, um, basically everyone throughout the network, I got to know in a different level. And because I was still somewhat of a manager, they, they would have to do that anyway. So when I came to my own branch, I felt like I'd almost had like the year and a half apprenticeship uh, before I got there. And, and granted, I also knew the people that were there, not very well, but enough to know what what makes them tick and without being too matey with them as well so yeah i think they're, they're doing the relief role to start with yeah definitely sort of broke it up and and didn't make it so full on because yeah, it certainly changes i think you know from going to being co-workers and mates with people to moving into that management position and i've always said you know everybody likes you until you have to tell them what to do um so it can be quite challenging at times now Running a higher branch is not unlike running your own business. You, uh, you, you're responsible for absolutely everything from the budget to the staff to, you know, obviously being in coats, it's a large organisation. They do have their, their head office, you know, rules and guidelines that you have to follow, but you are technically running your own business. So is that how you approach it? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, as you know, any sort of corporation, you, you're governed by certain rules and structures and, and overheads which you can't control, but everything else in between that, um, absolutely, it's like my own business, so I, I would treat it that way in terms of it's not my money, it's not Coates' money, it's whatever you have. If, if you need to buy something, it's a case of, are we going to get a good return on it? Is, is it worth it? Would I buy it myself? Uh, you don't, I wouldn't necessarily just willy-nilly go spending anything or doing anything if it wasn't my own. You still treat it like your own because ultimately I feel responsible for it and you get that, that sense of pride when, when you get good achievements. And what have you learned, do you think, about business since, you know, you commenced running your own branch last year? Yeah, it can certainly be uh, can be a great game and, of course, it'll be a fickle game at the same time. So, yeah, some things you can be completely out of your control and you might be doing the best you can possibly do, like budgets, for example, and you think you're flying and then all of a sudden a project that's supposed to happen gets delayed. And there's nothing at all you can, it's just the customer market that you've got to deal with and all of a sudden find however much revenue that you were going to get off that, you've got to go and find it somewhere else. Um, it doesn't just go away, you still need to cover it. And so that they can certainly be challenging. Um, but yeah, aside from that, that, yeah, it's just the things you can control what you control, you can't, there's some things you can't, but at the end of the day, you still have to find a way to move on with it. And speaking about things that you can't control, obviously you started that role in March 2020, which is when COVID sort of really did hit Australia. So that threw a spanner in the works for businesses, you know, all across the world. But how challenging was it to you to meet the budgets that had already been set through such a difficult and unprecedented time in Australia? Yeah, I suppose for us being in WA, we're, we're pretty lucky. We, I mean, it's quite well publicised. We've had quite strict border controls. Um, and also having only a small branch, we didn't have a huge amount of people gathering in one area. So 
we didn't have to worry about having people off or or anything like that specifically in, in my branch um, because we we're well into uh, well sort of adequate with the safe zones and and the two square meter rules and stuff like that. Uh, I know head office certainly found it challenging and, and a lot of the eastern states branches have had some issues um, but I suppose for us aside from the sort of mini lockdown for a couple of weeks we really didn't get affected too badly. Uh, road projects went ahead if anything that they picked up a lot because the government was spending a lot of money trying to keep people in jobs and and keep them employed and stuff like that so if anything we, we probably got a little bit busier so you were wow. quite lucky in WA in the end. Yeah, you guys are keeping everybody out. You're not letting anybody in over there. <laughs> no, that, that's exactly right. So it has its pros, but it has its cons as well. So hopefully one day we're yeah. back to a back to a normal world and we can go back over east and into state overseas. <laughs> Definitely. Now, Dylan, what's your next career goal? Um, my next career goal is probably move into a, an area manager role. Now, I don't necessarily know if it's a, a straight step. Um, I suppose as you start going up the, up the corporate ladder, you need to be sort of multifaceted in what your skills are. Now, I've always been operations focused, so it, it may mean to get there, I need to move into a sales role for a certain amount of time and, and understand how that side of the business works. Um, so I suppose possibly, ultimately, yeah, area regional management will be where, where I'd like to go. Uh, I may have to step sideways and and sort of expand on a few more skill areas before I get there. So definitely enjoying what I'm doing as, as branch manager now at the moment. And uh, so I'll, next step will be to, to get a bigger branch. Um, but then, yeah, up from there, just be expanding my skills to, to try and get up the next step. Yeah, I was going to ask you, so what do you think that you'll you know do or what are you already sort of doing both professionally and personally to be able to achieve that goal? Um, so I'm looking at doing some uh, leadership courses, development training, um, also looking to get basically the, the golden pieces of paper that everyone seems to need. It doesn't matter how much on the job experience you have or that I may still get in, in the years to come. A, a, lot, a lot of jobs, unless you've got the bit of paper that says you're qualified, it doesn't mean anything. So I'll, um, I'll sit down and, and, and go through those. Um, yeah, aside from that, that, that's pretty much it for me. Are you a planner? Like, do you have those sort of, you know, five-year, you know, big picture type things or do you just take things as they come towards you? Yeah, pretty, pretty much as they come. I've got, a, I've got a rough guide on what I want to do, but I'll never ever stick to a plan. So I'll, I'll wing it and it, one day it could be as simple as I might be Googling a course and I decide I like it and I'll sign up on the spot. It's, um, yeah, there's not much rhyme or reason to it. It's just, yeah, looks good, do it, spontaneous. <laughs> You've got a rough so, idea on where, where you need to go and what you need to do, but in terms of actually doing it, getting there, planning, timing, um, yeah, it's, it's definitely not set in stone. Now, you seem like you're in a really good place, you know, both professionally and personally, um, and I've really appreciated you taking the time to talk to me because I think it's really critical that people do see that, you know, you, you don't necessarily need that bit of paper and you don't necessarily need to know what you want to do straight out of school to be able to achieve great things you know like within nine years you've gone from a trainee to a branch manager and I think you know to put it into context for listeners um, you know Coates is like the largest hire company in Australia it's it's massive so it's a huge organization and, and to, as I said earlier to get that role in such a hugely competitive environment is you know hats off to you completely but before I let you go, Dylan, I do have one last question for you. What would you do differently if only you knew? If only I knew, I would probably not be so hard on other people. I had a tendency, especially early on, which I've learned through different managers how to sort of mellow it out and, and things like that, that because I, if I knew how to do a certain part of the job or what a process was, I would just assume everyone else would and didn't necessarily communicate that through. So then if something didn't happen that way or something went wrong, I'd be the first person to jump up and down and be like, what's going on here? Like, and yeah, I'd really sort of light a fire and, and almost explode in a way. And some of my managers would, would, would sit there sometimes and I might send an email or something like that. And they just look at me and go, why do I get the feeling my phone's gonna ring in, in, a, in a minute's time? Because it's gonna be repercussions or something like that. Um, 
but yeah, I've, I've definitely learned, you know, you, you don't always have to be right. Even even sometimes if you are right, you can lose the battle, but still win the war. Um, so yeah, I, I suppose yeah, not being so hard on others and, and definitely communicating and making sure everyone else is on the same page instead of assuming um, definitely helps you and goes a long way. Yeah, definitely. I think sometimes you do have to lose to win and, um, you know, you don't always have to, to to tell everybody that you've won either when you do get those wins. So thank yeah, you so absolutely. much for taking the time, Dylan, to, to chat with us today. And um, if you'd like to know more about Dylan, you can follow him on LinkedIn and I'll have a link to his socials and a bio on our website, ifonlyyouknewpodcast.com.au. Thanks, Dylan. Excellent. Thank you very much.